If you had said to me I would be using the phrase one month into the Russian invasion, three weeks ago after the first rockets landed in Kiev, I would have accused you of being way too generous and optimistic regards Ukraine's defences. I gave the Ukrainians two weeks tops before they would begin to suffer a cascade failure of their forces and eventually succumb to the endless juggernaut that is the Russian army. In fact, that was the Russian army's official prediction. Two weeks. When it became clear that week three was now an inevitability, and news of Russian casualties came in, that is when I made my previous video to this one, asking the question, why is Russia failing? In which I gave a brief outline of how this war started, why this war started, and why Russia hasn't crushed all in its way as expected. In the two weeks since that video has come out, I've discovered two things. First, that unsurprisingly, the entirety of my worldview I built up as a teenager was a lie. I don't know if all of you remember, but back when we were teenagers, I assume we all played Call of Duty Modern Warfare. In Modern Warfare 2, Ramirez and Foley defended the Burger Town heroically against advancing Spetsnaz as Russian troops seized New York and Washington DC in a lightning amphibious assault, while in Modern Warfare 3, Russian tanks crashed through the streets of Paris as we desperately rallied NATO to the defense, making our final stand under the Eiffel Tower. The Russians were this overpowering military juggernaut in all the popular media of the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s. Fast forward to my 28th birthday, watching a real-life war in Europe, and they can't get 90 miles from the Russian border before they run out of food and have to loot local shops and petrol stations for supplies and gas. Because they don't even have enough logistical support to begin with, and the logistics they do have keep being interdicted by Ukrainian drone strikes or stolen by Ukrainian resistance and National Guard units. However, as always, mainstream media offered incredible insights along the way. One reporter was aghast at the sight of Russian MREs having an expiry date of 2010, without realizing that we have MREs that we're using dating back to the 90s. Important tip, always make sure you have a rock or something with you. In any case, it's not how long that these MREs are stored that's the issue. The issue is that it's the Ukrainians taking those MREs for themselves, giggling as they torch the entire 30-truck convoy they came in. It has to be said, though, the Russian mess truck the Ukrainians captured was pretty depressing, to say the least. Nothing but onions, sugar beets, and potatoes. Ugh. The other thing I discovered was that Russian bots, as well as unmitigated, unabashed support for Russian troops, is so virulent on the internet like, it defies belief. We all knew that Russia had a significant cyber warfare capability. In fact, President Biden in recent statements said that this is the number one threat as far as direct threats to the United States during this conflict are concerned, as well as reports of cyber attacks all across the EU, NATO, and of course, especially in Ukraine itself. But I had no idea just how much pro-Russian propaganda there was floating around the internet, especially on YouTube on videos covering this war. So, in the interest of balance, I have decided, just to placate those pro-Russian commenters I got on my last video, to show a more objective review of the war, and report on the war from the Russian perspective with a pure, unbiased, and objective form of reporting they are used to. Welcome to Channel Russia Yesterday! Currently in the news, Russian troops are advancing down the main avenues of Washington, D.C. in glorious liberation parade. NATO has collapsed and Berlin is now in the hands of our forces once again since 1945. The entire EU is collapsing and President Zelensky has defected and Ukraine is joining the CSTO, welcoming our heroic forces as liberators. See? Nobody says I don't appreciate balance. And if I'm being honest, that report was probably more believable than some of the comments I got. Alas, here we are. And in stark contrast to their government's internet agents and robots, the average Russian people, who despite it all are still the same kind, cultured and humorous people they always were, have summed up how this war is going, the same way they did while under the Soviet Union. With a dark running joke. In fact, my favourite Soviet joke is, what's the tallest building in Moscow? The answer is, of course, KGB headquarters. You can see Siberia from the basement. In all seriousness, their joke about the Russian invasion of Ukraine is 
a far more accurate assessment than any of the mainstream media or outlets or even us YouTube commentators could ever give. The Russian joke these days goes as follows. We are now one month into our glorious two-week defensive operation. Everything is going according to plan. One day I hope they'll get the government they deserve. Even better, I hope they can manage to create one. They've done it a few times before. Take that comment how you will. Although, I have a feeling that the oligarchs will do it for them. Anyway, let's discuss the matter at hand. Thanks to a wonderful analyst on Twitter, Jemini of the West, who has been compiling combat reports in coordination with Ukrainian weapons tracker and the OSINT groups accounting for the movements and losses of Russian forces, we have, for this video, a comprehensive set of battle maps with approximate order of battle. As a historian and a wargamer, this makes my life so much easier and gives a much more accurate and professional view of this ongoing conflict. I'll cycle through the maps while I talk so you have an idea of the battle's progression. And I will start the bulk of this video from, of all days, as I mentioned before, my 28th birthday, and two days after I released my original video, March the 10th. If you haven't seen that video already, go watch that first because it lays the groundwork for this video. But I will include a bare bones overall summary, just in case you are simply looking for an update. So, here we go, quick recap. On February 24th, 2022, Russian forces initiated their invasion with precision strikes utilizing cruise missiles and aircraft against Ukrainian airfields, radar stations, and command and control installations in an attempt to disrupt the Ukrainian command structure while paving the way to achieve air superiority. This was in conjunction with saturation artillery strikes on Ukrainian army positions. This was immediately followed by a full-scale assault by mechanized units of the Russian ground forces along major highways around Ukraine. They began their assault from Belarus, Crimea, Voronezh in Russia, and the separatist republics. These advances were towards Kiev, Kherson, Kharkov, Cherniv, and throughout the Donbass region, the most aggressive of which being from the Crimea towards the separatist regions in the Donbass in order to link their two fronts. The ultimate goal of these advances in particular was to isolate major population centres, cut off Ukrainian forces in various pockets as part of traditional Soviet armoured and deep battle operations, leading to their envelopment and total destruction. Once this objective is complete, they are then to conduct mop-up operations and secure the population centres themselves, the most vital of which being the capital, Kyiv, the capture of which would decapitate the Ukrainian government in both a logistical and administrative capacity, with the potential to capture or kill their leader, President Zelensky. These advances would be supported by amphibious operations near Mariupol and Odessa by the Black Sea Fleet and its marine units, while air assaults were conducted on major airfields and critical infrastructure to allow for airlifted reinforcements and to isolate the Ukrainian defenders further while seizing critical infrastructure. Special efforts were also made to secure power and communications installations throughout the Russian line of advance, including Chernobyl, which resulted in a firefight through the famous abandoned city of Pripyat, resulting in the most terrifying Wikipedia article in history titled The Battle of Chernobyl. While concerns were raised as firefights and shelling took place around nuclear power plants, threatening to cause an environmental and humanitarian catastrophe should the reactors be damaged, during this period, a ferocious air battle took place between Ukrainian and Russian fighters, along with extensive deployment of SAM systems and man pads, man portable air defense systems. Losses on both sides in the air war during the initial invasion were heavy, with both fixed wing and rotary aircraft losses reaching critical levels in just several days. However, the Ukrainian Air Force, through conservative point defense tactics and extensive use of drones, defied all expectations and scored victories both in the air and in striking Russian ground units, with a focus on frontline SAM systems and supply convoys. That said, though, things did not go all Ukraine's way. In the first two days of the invasion, Russian gains were massive. Mechanized units smashed through the initial line of defense, wiping out the border guard units, and began rapid concentric advances down the highways, all leading to the population centers. In the south, Kherson fell to the Russians after fierce fighting, but they had managed to capture the road and rail network in southern Ukraine intact, meaning that within days, the southern advance eastward linked up with the troops in the Donbass 
and that was completed, encircling the city of Mariupol, which has resulted in the most brutal fighting of the war thus far. As the experienced troops of the separatist states and the Russian marines are locked in a house-to-house urban fight against the battle-hardened Ukrainian marines and the infamous Azov battalion. Worse still for the southern front, Russian troops, having advanced from Crimea, capturing the road and rail connections, while simultaneously linking up with the separatists, have been able to advance and maintain their lines of supply. While fighting has been intense in the cities and along the highways, the wider open spaces of southern Ukraine, combined with a better logistical situation, has given the attacking force the edge, and as such they have capitalized on that, slowly closing the vice on Ukrainian forces in the Donbass, capturing Ukrainian army depots, and interdicting National Guard units moving west to rejoin the main defence being mounted on the Dnieper River. But against all odds, and all expectations, somehow, some way, this has turned out to be the extent of Russian successes. Aside from local tactical victories where Russians have managed to bring their combined arms warfare and the superiority in assets to the fight, strategically and operationally, The Russian campaign, as of one month into the conflict, at least in its original configuration, has been nothing short of a strategic and operational catastrophic failure. In fact, it could be considered a disaster. Aside from Melitopol and Kherson, the Russians have failed to take any of Ukraine's major cities. Mariupol is under siege, but it is still holding out and the longer they hold out, the more damage they do to the Russian manpower and supply situation. Despite me saying their logistic situation in the south is better, and has allowed for a wider and more aggressive advance, after a month of war, I think it is safe for us to say that the logistic system of the Russian army is in a dire situation. There were, and are, still more confirmed sightings and reports of Russian forces scrounging from local stores and gas stations for food and fuel. Their transport casualties are high enough that civilian vehicles from Russia are being requisitioned for use as convoy vehicles. It is also reported that vehicles and trucks from Belarus and other members of the CSTO, or the CTSO rather, the Russian version of NATO, including Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and the other former Soviet states, have provided Russian forces with supply trucks from their inventories, and that the Russians have approached China for aid in purchasing equipment to restock their losses. Of all the areas of the Russian army that have been suffering in this war, it is logistics that have been the hardest hit. And this is definitely not an accident. Ukrainian forces have continued, from day one, to focus their efforts on the Russian logistics network. National Guard units and resistance forces have been hitting supply convoys constantly, while TB2 drones have been providing SIAD, or suppression of enemy air defense, to allow for those same drones, as well as what remains of the Ukrainian Air Force's fixed-wing ground attack capability, to hit Russian convoys and prevent their resupply. All of this is bad enough, but it doesn't get across just how bad the supply situation may be. The fact that I can mention the Ukrainian Air Force and that it is still able to mount sorties one month into this invasion is a scathing indictment of the Russian air campaign to date. After a full month, the Russian Air Force, known as the VKS, has not achieved air superiority. The Pentagon briefing regarding this issue described the Ukrainian air defense as adaptive and creative in its use of limited assets. Defense analysts the world over have singled the lack of Russian air superiority out as one of the biggest question marks regarding this whole conflict. How is this possible? But now, after more information has come in, and we have started getting some information, we are working out why that is. And, at the moment, from what we've been able to ascertain, there are two main issues facing the VKS. The first is their stores of precision-guided ordnance. At this time, stocks of precision-guided bombs and missiles have been dwindling. And not only that, their accuracy has been far less than stellar, despite supposedly being smart weapons. One of the major factors for this is their use in Syria, having depleted the limited stocks available for deployment. Another is that this is a high-intensity conflict for which the Russians were neither expecting nor prepared for. Captured Russian plans, as stated earlier, gave a two-week timetable for this war. We're now a month in, 
and even then, a highly contested invasion was not expected, with some soldiers being told they'd be hailed as liberators, or just ignored as they were during the Crimean annexation. But that doesn't explain their lack of effectiveness in the poor implementation of Russian air power. That's even weirder. It turns out that despite having an integrated space command, with the Russian space program having the capability to launch people to the space station, as well as the ability to deploy satellites, the Russians, unlike China or the United States, do not have their own satellite constellation for navigation. Meaning consequentially, their GPS capability comes from the public GPS network, and due to the military build-up prior to the invasion, rising tensions and sanctions, and of course the resulting backlash from the invasion itself, Russia was cut off and blocked from the global GPS network, forcing them to operate with inertial navigation systems, INS for short, making coordination, geolocation, and navigation a lot harder for both air and ground units. But even worse than that, it also means their GPS-guided munitions will have to be aimed the same way, with ballpark INS coordinates, or even worse in some cases, used as dumb bombs due to them being unable to be guided. The other major factor facing the Russian Air Force now ties into their original logistical issues. The Russian Air Force has been flying intense operations. The Strategic Bomber Force, that being the TU-160 Blackjacks, TU-22 Backfires, and TU-95 Bears, have finally started making their appearance, but due to the intact air defense network of the Ukrainians, they've been forced to launch standoff cruise missile attacks from inside Russia and Belarus, rather than deploy their conventional bomb loads. And with the aforementioned navigational issues, these strikes have proven to be far less effective than they should be. But in flying these operations, as well as the frontal aviation assets for helicopters and close air support, the Russian Air Force has not been deploying the majority of its air power. We haven't seen combat air patrols by fighters, we haven't seen sea admissions, we haven't seen any of the high intensity raids we'd expect, and most damning of all, despite having an increasing number of AWACS, Airborne Early Warning Command and Control Systems aircraft, none of those aircraft are flying. As covered in my previous video, the Russians don't have enough money to cover the spare parts they need to keep the Air Force flying, nor do they have their pilots get enough training or combat flight hours. Like, th like really, the Russian Air Force is in a terrible situation logistically overall. But it's getting worse. Open source intelligence has indicated that they have an even bigger problem than those standard operational issues. Russian air operations from their strategic fleet has intensified in the hope of dealing serious damage to population centers like Kharkov and Kiev, while hitting strategic targets. But aviation operations, especially one for large bombers with heavy cruise missile payloads, are intensive on fuel consumption. Likewise, close air support missions are heavy on fuel, as you have to fly low through thicker air at full speed to get into the target, prosecute the attack, and then get out alive. Before the ban on flight through Russian airspace was enforced, several airliners, notably a South Korean airline, because those have always historically done well when Russia is in a conflict. Yep. South Korean aircraft landed at Moscow International on layover into Europe. In doing so, they were denied refueling. Also, due to the sanctions and the international embargo, while Russia is a huge exporter of gas and crude oil, their refining capacity is not as high as it is in the West or the Middle East. Not only their exports, but their imports are shot as well. Meaning that long story short, one of the theories behind a far weaker Russian air presence is simply they don't have any gas. Gas prices are bad enough around the world as it is, it's no surprise that the Russians are feeling the squeeze too. They have no fuel. The Russian Air Force doesn't have air superiority. It can't use precision guided ordnance to destroy Ukrainian air bases and SAM sites to get said superiority, and it can't get enough fuel together to launch a large scale assault to overwhelm that existing Ukrainian air defense, resulting in the Ukrainians being able to hit the logistic systems with their own air power, while National Guard and resistance fighters hit the convoys and ambushes along the road. The simple fact is, logistical demand for the Russian forces is high but the number of men and equipment they have ne is all needed at the front to fight the Ukrainian professional forces, meaning they don't have the men to guard their own lines of supply, meaning that Ukrainian irregular units just keep hitting the logistics chain, 
This in turn causes the same cascade failure that the Wehrmacht suffered during its drive east. The Ukrainians hold most of the rail hubs and highway interchanges due to the fact that they hold all of the cities. Therefore, you have to walk or drive the supplies up along side roads or ring roads. In doing this, you lose supplies to raids and attrition. Furthermore, your men at the front are still engaged with the professional and determined enemy. And due to the strained supply lines, you're limited in what you can send. So the food, fuel, extra supplies, new uniforms, extra gear that they need to mount an offensive or even just to maintain their position is not getting through because you have to prioritize ammo shipments to stop your men from literally running out of ammo and getting murdered. And of course, due to the attrition and the fact that the Ukrainians use the same weapon systems, a lot of the munitions you do send end up getting shot back at you. And so there it is. After a full month of combat operations, the Russians still do not have air superiority and are in the midst of a horrific logistics crisis. Tie that in with the existing issue of a lack of highways, the fact that the Ukrainians control all the major cities, and all the rail hubs and highways, and the current climate causing off-road conditions to still be a quagmire of mud, them having launched offensive operations during the onset of spring, resulting in their vehicles being bogged down, abandoned, and otherwise unable to move to any significant degree off-road, the ability of Russian forces to maintain their operational tempo is, as they say, kaput. And so, as a result, the offensive has stalled. And what we have is this situation on March 10th. Stagnation. The fronts have moved very little in the past two weeks, as you've probably observed, and it doesn't look like they're going to move much further. The historical parallels here are rather striking. Originally, as the first part of the war played out, this situation was beginning to share common themes with the Winter War, a savagely brutal near-peer fight where the Russians would lose heavily but ultimately triumph. And at this point, the jury is still out on whether that's the case. But now, given the strategic and operational situation, this may have changed. I said in my original video that I expected the Russians to get their proverbial shit together and then launch a concerted effort to break out of their footholds and start taking ground. But now we are here. The unthinkable is no longer unthinkable. The Ukrainians might, with a little help, a lot of spirit, and a demoralized and disorganized Russian force, the Ukrainians just might pull off a win, which as each day passes grows more and more likely. Putin, like the famous mustache man before him, is in a strategic quandary of titanic proportions. Much like the Axis in the Second World War, they are geopolitically and geographically isolated, with trade cut off, international and political tension, and hemorrhaging their limited resources. Not to mention there is a massive political shakeup going on inside Russia right now. The oligarchs aren't happy about Putin getting all their money taken away. World War II was a game of industry, production, resources, and manpower. Modern warfare, while still paying mind to those things, is one more of tactical utility and operational mobility. Both the Warsaw Pact and NATO during the height of the Cold War really only had munition stocks for maybe three months of full-scale combat. Even now, the United States has run into major logistical issues during the global war on terror, especially during the invasion of Iraq. You hear stories of soldiers in Kuwait during 2003 buying their own equipment, optics, gear, and other necessities because there wasn't enough to go around. They didn't have enough chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear equipment, seaburn or mop gear. They didn't have any in desert camo, so everyone got issued woodland camo instead, in the middle of a desert. They didn't have enough APCs, helicopters, most of them rolled in in trucks and Humvees. There is even a case of a Marine Corps squadron asking a museum if they could raid one of their F-18s on display for parts. It wasn't until the American war machine wound up to speed again that they got their logistic issues sorted, and even then, to this day, the E-4 Mafia and the Lance Corporal Underground, that being soldiers buying, trading and stealing equipment from each other, the government or even the private sector, are the only reason the military is combat effective. 
They basically have to bodge it together themselves. Now, if this is the most powerful war machine in the history of humankind, who has invaded, bombed, or otherwise screwed over about three quarters of the developing world in the past half a century, if they have that logistic trouble just getting organized, what hope does the shadow of a superpower with a shoestring budget and a corruption problem have? The answer ever we've seen in Ukraine is close to none. They don't have enough spare parts, smart munitions, trained reservists, food or fuel to support their army in the field for extended periods in peacetime, and now they are in a full-scale, proper conventional war. They are up the creek, and like the Axis in World War II, due to their isolation, it is a ticking clock. The longer this war goes on, the more casualties they take, the more fuel, food and ammo they go through, the less they have to go around. But the true determining factor is that the Ukraine has switched from being Finland in this World War II metaphor. They are now the UK. The entire world is feeding them what they need, literally and metaphorically. The longer the war goes on, the more aid from NATO arrives, more javelins, end laws, more Soviet legacy systems. The former Warsaw Pact nations are being compensated by the Western NATO allies, and as such, they're handing all their old Soviet gear the Ukrainians are trained on. Everything from S-300 SAM systems, to BM-21 Grads, to Polish Piron Manpad systems, soon to be followed by, rumour has it, replacement aircraft in the form of MiG-29s and SU-25s. Not to mention every spare AK, RPG, and Strela left over from the bad old days. Hell, the Germans, the Spanish, practically all of the EU are sending their own weapon systems. The latest model of Panzerfausts, disposable launchers of every type. The sheer amount of firepower being sent into Ukraine is just ridiculous. And this is on top of all the backup they've been receiving in terms of food, fuel, medical supplies, as well as the evacuation of non-combatants. In Poland and Romania, we've seen reports of the general public opening up their spare rooms, uh, landlords opening up their spare apartment blocks that they're not having any tenants in, public buildings being transformed into refugee centres. The amount of material, logistical, and military support in the form of volunteer legions going to Ukraine as well? Like, the amount of backup they've received internationally is insane. Combined with all the sanctions and diplomatic pressure being placed on Russia, it's the world has never seen anything like it. Switzerland has frozen the oligarchs' money. Switzerland has been neutral for the past 300 years. They they haven't done anything. And this they didn't even freeze the Nazis' assets. And here they are, freezing oligarchs' money. I, look, it's gotten to the point where even the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg is contributing arms to Ukraine. Luxembourg contributed 300 end laws. That's their entire stock. My subscriber base is bigger than their entire military and most likely their entire government and civil service as well. And they are supplying arms. There are so many N-Laws being shipped to Ukraine, they're probably using Amazon Prime at this point. But the most astonishing thing about all of this is that even with all this NATO support and aid, all of these weapon systems like the Stinger, the Javelin, the Enlaw, all of this gear, while excellent, against all predictions, defying all expectations, the most dangerous weapon system in the Ukrainian arsenal, of all things, is the John Deere tractor. I could take you out on my big green tractor We can go slow or make it go faster Down through the woods and out to the pasture As long as I was you, it really don't matter Climb up in my lap and drive if you want to You know me, you gotta hold on to We can go to town, but baby if you'd rather I can take you for a ride on my big green tractor Around, sit up on the hill and watch the sun go down. When the fireflies are dancing and the moon comes out, we can turn on the lights and head back to the house. 
We can take a ride on my big green tractor We can go slow or make it go faster Down through the woods and out to the pasture As long as I'm with you, it really don't matter Climb up in my lap and drive if you want to Girl, you know you got me to hold on to We can go to town, baby, if you'd rather I'll take you for a ride on my big green tractor A fantastic and hilarious meme though it is, it does lead into an important point. The Ukrainians have been managing to capture a significant, nay, an insane amount of Russian gear. And when I say insane, I really do mean it. After checking the UA weapons tracker and the Attack on Europe project, close to a third of confirmed Russian equipment losses are captured. This includes tanks, armored personnel carriers, SAM systems, much of that equipment, due to Ukraine being a former Soviet state, they have the ammo, fuel, and the training to use. In fact, the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense asked their units not to burn them or sabotage them, rather mark them for recovery by local engineering units, or failing that, the local construction company with their crane. They even issued a statement saying that you don't have to claim captured Russian tanks as income on your tax. Like, that quite frankly is god-tier propaganda and peak trolling, which speaks to the high morale of the Ukrainian defenders. And that, perhaps, even after everything I've mentioned, is the biggest aspect of this war. Morale in a fighting force is quite possibly the most important factor. The Russian forces we've seen, with the exception of the VDV and Chechen units, have demonstrated almost no desire to fight. They're lethargic and sluggish, poorly trained. They lack motivation. I mean, we've even seen the opposite. Intercepted communications from Russian troops back home, as well as morale among the POWs that they've captured, like, morale's rock bottom. With some reporting executions for retreating and cowardice, others reporting being lied to about the invasion for a myriad of reasons. Just like Chechnya, just like Georgia, these men aren't the hardened professionals of the Red Army or the blood-crazed vengeful spirit of a post-9-11 US military. These are... It's really sad. These are poor young boys. These are Russian uni students, drafted and told to take up arms against a country which half of them have family in. Which is the saddest part of this whole affair. So far, discipline among Russian forces is being maintained. Barely, such as it is. But the looting, the desertions, the surrenders... It paints a picture of an army not wanting to be here. It, it, they don't want to be in this war. That said, given how this war is going and how bloody it's getting, I think, if nothing else, the dreams of a mass mutiny and the Russian army surrendering, I, I don't think it's in sight. I think, like most drafty armies, they'll fight. Many of them will fight, as many drafty armies, and in fact just soldiers in general, they end up fighting... Not for the government, not for Putin, not for any of this. They'll fight for their mates next to them and the hope that they can go home. They want to get out of this alive. Every soldier fights for their buddies and the hope that they can get home alive. But, but as it stands now, the chances of that aren't very good. Getting accurate casualty reports is hard during a war, especially full-scale conventional wars like this. Neither side will confirm their own casualties, while simultaneously they'll inflate their number of kills. The Ukrainians are claiming something around 16,000 Russian KIA with proportional wounded, you know, with like 300 tanks and 1,000 APCs. Like, I'll put the uh, Kiev Independent tracker up here. They've been publishing Ukrainian Ministry of Defense figures throughout the war, and they've been a vital source of news, but... Like, these figures seem too good to be true, and they don't correlate to the confirmed losses we have in photographs and geolocated evidence for. That said, all militaries do overclaim damage to enemy forces. Americans do it, NATO does it, the Germans did it during World War II, the Russians did it during World War II, like, Japan especially. The Japanese air forces during World War II were bad for this. In fact, all air forces are bad for this. Overclaiming is common. That said, if you halve the numbers provided by the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense, those losses are still catastrophic. 
I'll post the up-to-date confirmed casualties from the Attack on Europe project on the screen. Uh, I'll try and cycle through each category as I'm talking. But I think with the Kiev independent numbers, a 20% margin for error is the most realistic estimate. Leaked Russian Ministry of Defense information corroborates this. Pentagon sources quoted conservative about 8,000 Russian KIA. Ukrainian reports are double that. But the leaked Russian information claims around 9,800 KIA since mid-March, so it's likely to be around the 10,000 range, with 16 to 17,000 wounded. Comparing that to the vehicle, aircraft, and general operational losses, this sounds about right to me. We have no accurate information on Ukrainian casualties, but given their extensive uses of irregular formations and the fact that the Russians have switched to a more conventional force-on-force posture, and despite their issues, the Russian Air Force still has plenty of combat power, I would say that Ukrainian casualties are similar, if not higher. But seeing as they are fighting on home ground with forces that have been waging a civil war since 2014, the Ukrainians, ironically enough, have more men and equipment in the battle area than the Russians do, and about half of them have recent combat experience in the Donbass. But most critical here, the most critical area in this equation, besides that experience, is what they got to get that experience. Namely, after the annexation of Crimea and the formation of the Euromaidan government, the Ukrainian military got extensive training and support from their NATO partners, mainly AUKUS, which is what it's called now, mainly the United States, UK, the Anzacs, us and the Kiwis, and Canada. We have seen the use of NATO tactics popping up all throughout the Ukrainian forces during this war. Well, yeah. So all that said, given I went through all the trouble to get these battle maps, it's about time we actually talk about the military situation. Shall we? As we can see on the battle map, it seems my prediction for the Ukrainian defense was correct. As you can see, the majority of the Ukrainian heavy divisions have been deployed around the two main axes of advance towards Kiev from the north and the south. All of Ukraine's armor is focused on halting these two moves, and up to now they have successfully done so. Fun fact, due to the number of captured tanks from the Russians, the Ukrainian tank corps is actually larger than it was prior to the invasion. Credibly, I think across the board, Ukrainian vehicle losses are net zero due to the amount of hardware they've captured. Meanwhile, Ukrainian infantry forces have been rendering the aptly named cope cages on top of Russian tanks completely useless. Both sides' grandfathers discovered to their cost that meshing does not stop Panzerfausts from wrecking a T-34, and so now the Russians are discovering that meshing indeed does not stop javelins either. In fact, even the reactive armor, that is, armor that explodes in front of an anti-tank weapon to deflect and destroy the warhead, has proven ineffective against the top attack capabilities of the Javelin and the Enlaw. Not only that, the venerable Jamsheed Special, the RPG-7, has proven its worth once again, with Ukrainians putting tandem RPG rounds to good use, as well as the various disposable launches of all types, AT-4s to good old laws, NATO has sent them everything. Like stingers for anti-air, AT-4s, laws, like these weird Spanish launches, they got everything. The biggest problems for the Russians, though, are still the urban centers. 190,000 men is not enough to launch a concerted effort to clear the cities of their defenders. Mariupol is holding against its siege, and casualties have been horrendous on both sides. Chernihiv, Kharkov are now firmly fortified. And as for Kyiv, some US veterans of the global war on terror in the Volunteer Legions, including some who fought in Fallujah, have said that the level of fortification the city has undergone the past month has made the place into a death trap, saying they weren't sure if even an American force twice the size of the Russian invasion could take the city inside of a month. If the Russians want to take the capital now, like with Mariupol, they'll have to surround the city, blast it, siege it, and then slowly clear it over a two-month period. And even then, they'll need a lot more men and reserves. For your reference, it took roughly 100,000 men, air supremacy, and a couple of weeks for the Americans to take Fallujah, a city one-fifth the size of Kiev. In World War II, it took over a million men on each side to contest Stalingrad. They don't have the men, 
And even if they did, it will be a problem, as we've established, their supply network is up shit creek as it is. It can't support the 150,000 men or so they have left out there now, let alone the 300,000 reserves from other military districts they'd need to call in to proceed with those operations. The Ukrainians have conducted what is essentially a perfect defense. And the way the Ukrainian defense has been conducted is in fact exactly how NATO was trained to stop the Red Army during the Cold War. The Ukrainians are using what's called the active defense. They have dug in around areas the Russians will have to take in order to advance their logistics network. The Ukrainians know which roads and rail links they'll have to use, and so they're defending them. They're defending Kharkov, Cherniv, Kiev, etc. But they're defending these objectives with territorial and reserve units. The professional army units are concentrated in the defensive version of what was called the Soviet Operational Maneuver Group, an active reserve kept behind the front ready to exploit a breakthrough, only in this case they're being used to counter breakthroughs, and around Kiev especially, they're being used to mount local counterattacks. The Russians around Kiev have been forced into a defensive posture. They're digging in. The Ukrainians are counterattacking in several locations, the focal point being around Makariv. And as of two days ago, they retook the city. The reason this is a big deal is that this city controls the main east-west highway into Kiev. If they can hold that city and then flank the Russian forces holding the highway, they have a good chance of encircling them there. In fact, it's this situation which is thought to be what President Zelensky was referring to in his turning point of the war comment during one of his recent speeches. Furthermore, reopening that highway would once again allow for a more direct route to supply the capital with arms and supplies for the city's defense, making the Russians' position that much more difficult. This counterattack has been supported by a wider offensive launched by the Ukrainians to pressure the Russian main supply routes. NASA wildfire satellites are able to pick up large fires from battle sites, and if we check this image here, you can see that the western side of the Russian advance towards Kiev is alight from bottom to top with burning vehicles and the aftermath of extensive shelling and rocket strikes. While this is heartening news, I would link it into the intelligence gathered about the Russian build-up in this area. It has been an extensive build-up around here with that massive long convoy they had before. Although it wasn't really a convoy, it was a traffic jam. But the reason all those trucks were being sent there is that they've been setting up forward operations bases, artillery positions, and there's even news of a pipeline being built from Belarus all the way into the middle of Ukraine in order to fuel. Ve- there's even news of a fuel pipeline being hooked in from Belarus to fuel vehicles at the front, similar to the Allied fuel pipeline in Normandy during World War II. In order to preclude the need to, in order to preclude the need to ship the oil through highly vulnerable fuel trucks, in order to preclude the need to ship the fuel through highly vulnerable fuel trucks, I'm guessing that the Ukrainians are committing their reserve to this attack to prevent the Russians from getting fully reorganized. Ukrainian drone strikes have picked up in intensity, as have Russian close air support sorties from their aircraft based in Belarus, to check this move. But with NATO replacing the Ukrainian heavier SAM and AAA systems that they lost earlier in the war, Russian air casualties are starting to climb seriously. We also have reports that Russian units are starting to get moved from the far eastern military districts around Vladivostok and the central military district in the Ural Mountains. Roskvadia reserve units, that being the uh, Russian National Guard, are also being called up, with the Voronezh district on the Ukrainian border asking local businesses to donate food and supplies to these newly raised troops. Indiscriminate bombing of Ukrainian cities has also escalated, with dumb fire munitions being used more and more frequently in saturation strikes by MLRS, Grad, and Uragan systems. The Russians have also stepped up their use of thermobaric and cluster bomb munitions, in an effort to destroy the defenders along with anyone around them. A Pentagon briefing on this situation has stated that they think the Russians are resorting to more brute force tactics than they have been in order to try and get some momentum into their forces in order to seize the initiative and retain it. But from what we've seen so far this week, it appears, against all the odds that the unthinkable has happened, 
the invading force has lost the initiative and the Ukrainians are more than happy to take it off them. Along with their offensive around Kiev, there have been concentrated efforts by Ukrainian armoured units in the south, supported by what's left of the Ukrainian fixed-wing assets, who, due to the Russians in the south being too far from the Crimean air defence network, are still able to operate. These units are moving to retake Kherson, and so far, it looks like they may actually start rolling the Russians back. Russian communications, meanwhile, are still not good. In fact, they're worse. Many Russian troops have begun using Ukrainian SIM cards in their phones due to Russian SIM cards not getting service, allowing the Ukrainian forces to track their locations via GPS. What's even better is that Ukrainian telecom has been blanketing the area with automated text messages, offering Russian troops incentives and asylum if they surrender or defect. We have one case of this working so far. A Russian soldier who had been receiving Ukrainian PSYOP texts defected with a tank. And all this time, they are still communicating on unencrypted radio frequencies up to the battalion level, allowing the Ukrainians to listen to every single thing their enemies are saying and then moving accordingly. I have I have no words. Like, I... I I honestly can't believe this. I used to work in telecommunications. I used to work for Australia's biggest telecommunications company. My father was in signals communications in the Australian army in the 1970s through the 80s. Okay? I I just can't. This is basic shit. Like, the absolute basic shit. You can't get this wrong. It's the most vital part. Communication security and operational security, guys. Like, Christ. I'm happy the Russians are being this bad as it means the Ukrainians will get their country back, but this upsets me and offends me on a professional level. Encrypt your communications, for God's sake. Half the people watching this are using a VPN. Civilians have better OPSEC than you do. We have encrypted radios. We have burst coders. You do too. The Soviet encryption and signal intelligence guys were some of the best during the Cold War. How are you this bad? Sorry, this just this just drives me nuts. As a guy who's close to this field, it no. Also, due to these OPSEC failures, as well as the balls of Russian special operations units, things have gotten even worse for the Russians. More senior battlefield commanders have been killed in the Russian army than in any other instance since World War II. In fact, at this time the Ukrainians have claimed six senior field grade officers, including generals, three of which have been confirmed. No other army in the world has lost this many senior commanders in a modern conflict. And casualties among NCOs and junior officers have been just as bad, in fact higher. People tracking obituaries in Russia have noted that VDV units have been particularly hard hit, which is unsurprising as they are the main force that hit Hostomel Airport during the opening phase, and their ground reinforcements are the guys fighting around Kiev. We've seen quite a few destroyed BMD-2s, the... uh, airborne infantry fighting of vehicles ubiquitous to VDV units. And the fact that these are some of their most experienced troops, for the Russians, this these losses are a disaster. They can't afford to lose experienced personnel as it is, and yet these are the guys they're losing the most of. It's, it's not good. So, in summing up, here is the latest update from the front and where I'll wrap up the video. All the issues I outlined in my first video are still present, and in many cases worse. The Russian logistics situation is dire. Ukraine's airspace is still contested. The Ukrainians are counterattacking, and Russian reserves are being pulled in from further afield. More and more NATO support is arriving, and sanctions are starting to hit hard, in fact even harder. The lack of imports is affecting Russia's ability to wage the war due to fuel shortages and an inability to repair or replace damaged equipment, while casualties on both sides are mounting at a far higher rate than expected. The worst disaster thus far during the conflict has been a Russian artillery strike on Sumy, causing severe damage to a chemical plant, resulting in an evacuation and an exclusion zone being set up. And yet, against all odds, and quite frankly, even being on the side of the defenders, I'm pro-Ukraine, I can't believe I'm saying this. A Russian victory is now no longer an inevitability. I still maintain that with sheer mass they will recover and stabilize the situation. 
But as it stands now, the Ukrainian situation is now no longer a heroic but hopeless last stand. Despite all the predictions, despite all the punditry, despite all the number crunching, the human factor is shining through. It is more true than ever that it is not the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. And I'll end on a quote from Winston Churchill. The destiny of man is not measured in material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn that we are spirits, not animals. There is something going on in time and space and beyond time and space, beyond which spells duty. This is not the end, nor is it the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. The Ukrainians have a rendezvous with destiny, and when looking at this map, seeing the counter-offensive being waged on all fronts, the fact that almost all their major cities still hold and NATO aid is flooding in, maybe, just maybe, against all the odds, Ukraine will stand. Ils sont noirs de notre peine, ils sont rouges de notre sang, ils sont noirs de notre peine, ils sont rouges de notre sang. Allez, monde, par les plaines, dans la neige et dans le vent, à travers de l'Ukraine. Se levaient nos partisans à travers toute l'Ukraine. Se levaient nos partisans au printemps, les traités de Lénine ont libéré l'Ukraine aux Allemands. À l'automne, la Magnovchina les avait jetés au vent. À l'automne, la Magnovchina les avait jetés au 